So good evening to all of us who are on the call and those who will be uh, continuing to join. We've had a good registration list and I'm hoping that those who have registered will be able to attend our uh, Chop It Up NC event with our distinguished author, uh, Jonathan Eague. My name is Dr. Paul McAllister. I am the chair of the Interfaith Caucus and I am the moderator for uh, Chop It Up NC, an event for those of you who may not be familiar with it, uh, has its origins with a representative in our state house a legislature named Zach Hawkins. Zach started Chop It Up NC, and we use this as a forum to have conversations with men of color on issues that impact our daily lives here in the state of North Carolina and indeed beyond the state of North Carolina. A little bit about our North Carolina Democratic Party. Uh, I am the chair of one of roughly 20 caucuses that we have, and this event is uh, being held in particular to attract the, uh, the interest and the attention of our young Dems, and, uh, um, and we are fortunate tonight to have Mr. Dorian uh, Palmer, who is the president of the college Dems, and that includes both team I should say young Dems, and that includes both teen and college age young people. Uh, we fully anticipate that this uh, conversation will not only be viewed tonight, but will be viewed many, many, many times over, over the course of the coming year. And so I'm excited to have all of us uh, present, but in particular, I'm happy to have our author, before we begin, I'm going to open the floor for Mr. Palmer, since you're here tonight, to greet us in your own way. Can y'all hear me okay? Good afternoon, North Carolina Democrats. Good I am afternoon. pleased to join you. Um, Reverend McAllister, thank you for the invitation. As so often is the case, young folks across our state and across our country are working in ways to organize and engage and show up and talk within our communities. So while this evening there aren't cl clearly many young folks on the call, <laughs> what I have committed to is ensuring that the folks within the Young Democrats of North Carolina and the College Democrats of North Carolina and the Teen Democrats of North Carolina hear this conversation and while we're working to engage in communities and show up, we know that young people have to turn out to vote in 2024. It's not a question, it's not an option, particularly young black and brown folks. All that said, I live in Western North Carolina in Burke County, and I am grateful for all of you being here and for the, and for the welcome and invitation from Dr. McAllister, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dorian, and um, we look forward to interviewing facing with you in the months to come as we approach uh, our 2024 election. By way of an announcement, those who are uh, tuned in to this call tonight, as I've already mentioned, we have roughly 20 caucuses in the North Carolina Democratic Party. And our host is actually the Director of Community and Coalitions, who is Shantae Anthony. Uh, you don't see her, uh, in, well, there she is. Thank you, Shante. And our uh, distinguished intern is also with her tonight, Sophie Teague. So uh, if you two want to greet us in your own uh, special way, then feel free to do so. Shante. I'll go first. Hello, everyone. My name is Sophie Teague. Um, I am an Ava Clayton Fellow with the North Carolina Democratic Party, working with Shantae um, in the Coalitions and Community Engagement Department. I'm a senior at UNC Chapel Hill studying political science, um, and I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Sophie. Um, and thank you for all the hard work that you do. It's great having you on the team. Um, I particularly also want to thank Dr. McAllister because you took on this mantle um, with 
not necessarily knowing how much work it would be involved and you've done a great job and I appreciate that very much. So yes, in North Carolina, we have um, 20 caucuses and, and um, auxiliaries. There are affiliated organizations and it's a space for everyone in the Big Ten. And that is one of the great ways that we're able to do the outreach and make connections with voters in North Carolina because there's a place for everyone. And I am so appreciative of the volunteer work that our leaders do to to make it happen and I appreciate it. I'm Shantae, I try to not be the face, so I'm going away now, bye-bye. Okay. All right, so let's introduce our uh, guest tonight. Uh, uh, Jonathan Eag was born in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, and I'm reading from Wikipedia, uh, by the way. <laughs> um, um, I should say America's favorite source of information, just like Walmart is America's favorite shopping center. Um, Mr. Eag was born in Brooklyn, New York. He grew up in Monsey, New York. He's Jewish. His father was an accountant. His mother was a stay-at-home mom and community activist. He began working for his hometown newspaper when he was 16. He attended Northwestern University's Medal School of Journalism, graduating in 1986 with a bachelor's degree. After college, he worked as a news reporter for the New Orleans Times, Picayune, um, the Dallas Morning News, Chicago Magazine, the Wall Street Journal. He has taught writing at Columbia College, Chicago, and lectures at Northwestern. And we can read on and on and on. I think that it's, is, it is sufficient to say we are honored with your presence with us tonight um, to talk about your latest uh, book, which is absolutely riveting, uh, King, A Life. And uh, with that said, uh, I would ask you to introduce yourself however you choose and tell us a little more about you, and then we'll get into the conversation about your book. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Dr. McAllister, and thanks for having me. Um, as you noted from my Wikipedia entry, which was quite accurate, um, I am a longtime journalist. I worked for newspapers and magazines for a long time and began writing books, oh, about 20 years ago now. And um, I've written books about Muhammad Ali, about uh, the baseball player Lou Gehrig, uh, Jackie Robinson, uh, about the invention of the birth control pill. And this is my most recent book, uh, a book that took me six years to write. Um, and um, I'm, I'm happy to be here with you today talking about it. So this is going to be a sort of free for all. Um, I'm still reading the book and, and the reason why I'm still reading it is because I like to go back and reread what I've read and process and compare uh, what I'm reading in this book uh, uh, with other resources about the other life of Dr. King. And so if you had to uh, share with us what inspired you to even take on this enormous task. Six years is not light work. Um, what inspired you to, uh, uh, to take a fresh look at the life of Dr. King? And what are some of the uh, things that you lift up in this book that may be a little different from what one might find in other biographies? I wanted to write a book that would humanize King. And I felt like in the process of celebrating him and in the process of celebrating him as a national holiday on his birthday every year and, and erecting a monument in Washington, DC, we have lost sight of his humanity. And in doing so, we lost sight of his religious faith. We lost sight of his um, radicalism. We lost sight of his um, his struggles. The fact that he, that he did have moments of doubt and insecurity, that he suffered depression. I wanted to write a book that made him feel like someone we could relate to and not this mythological figure. And it began really with uh, my work on the Ali book. When I was researching my Ali book, I was interviewing people who knew King. I interviewed Andrew Young and Dick Gregory, Harry Belafonte, Jesse Jackson. And sometimes they would start talking about Martin Luther King. And it was at that time that I had sort of the epiphany that there were still many people alive who knew King personally some of them who knew him quite intimately. And that if, uh, if we were to do a new King biography, this would be the time to do it while, while these folks were still around and, and could be tapped as a resource. So um, I began asking them, I, you know, as I was speaking to them about Ali, do you think that, the, that we need a new King biography? 
how long has it been since the last one? And the last King biography was at that point was 35 years ago. It was now more than 40 years ago since the last King biography. So uh, a lot of the people who knew King best and even a lot of the scholars in the King universe um, encouraged me and said that they thought this was a, um, a project that that um, would be would be helpful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm particularly intrigued by his relationship or not so relationship with uh, the FBI uh, and not the salacious stuff, but just of the fact that he was so harried and dogged over so many years, even beginning very early in his ministry in Montgomery. What would you like to tell us about that? Well, that was a big part of why I wanted to do this book too, because I don't think we have fully reckoned with the complete nature of the FBI's attack on King. Um, we somewhat excuse it or we forget just how, um, how racist, how pernicious and how damaging it was. You know, King, um, from the time he emerges as a leader in, in, in Montgomery becomes a target of the FBI. Why? Let's just stop and ask ourselves that question because what is he trying to do that might be perceived as a threat to American democracy, that might be perceived as a threat to law enforcement, nothing. He's trying to improve American democracy. He's trying to make it more complete. He's trying to help this country live up to the words of the Declaration and the Bill of Rights. And he's not asking his followers to tear down the, the, the system. He's asking America to, he's, he's, he's encouraging his followers to join the system. He wants America to, to benefit from the contributions that the people who have been mistreated in this country might bring to bear. And for that, the FBI turns him into an enemy. Um, J. Edgar Hoover refers to him as a, as, a, as a liar, as a danger to American society, and he turns his powers to attempting to destroy King. And that's something that I think American society has not yet reckoned with. Mm -hmm. I don't think we've reckoned with it either. And as I struggle to sort of process all that uh, he encountered, what do you think, uh, Jonathan, might have been the repercussions of those investigations that he would eventually uh, discover? Um, how do you think that impacted those around him, not just his wife Coretta, but even the larger community uh, that surely must have known something. They must have seen something or felt something. Um, and perhaps there was some impulse that was buried uh, that, 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 that we can learn something from. Uh, what are your views of that? Well, it, it goes at many levels. On, on a professional level, as an organizational level, for a group that's trying to lead a social movement, that's trying to lead a grassroots movement, they're made to feel like the enemy. They're made to feel like uh, their country is against them, that they're rebels. Um, and they were radical reformers, but they were trying to improve American democracy, as I said earlier. So King and his, and his supporters, the SCLC in particular, the, the fellow leaders of the SCLC are, t are getting it from all sides, really. Um, they're being criticized for being too slow, too conservative by many of the younger, more active uh, left-wing activists, by members of SNCC, by members of uh, the Nation of Islam. And on the other extreme, they're being hailed as too radical um, by moving too fast by many religious leaders, by many um, Northern progressives. So King really can't win. And then on top of that, the organization that he's trying to help, the, you know, he's trying to work with the president of the United States. He's trying to work with Congress to pass legislation that will make America, more just society that will allow more people to vote. The American government itself is out to get him. And the FBI, it's not just the FBI, because members of Congress are aware of it, the president is aware of it. Uh, but they are leading an active campaign to try to undermine his work, to try to damage his emotion, damage his marriage, um, destroy him emotionally, and um, ruin his reputation. So all of that is, is, is up, he's up against all of that. And, it, and, it, and it, that affects his ability to fundraise, it affects his ability to function as a leader, and it affects his ability to attract um, other people to work with him. So it's, I don't think, um, you know, it, it's, sometimes we say, well, you know, the media at least didn't report on what King was doing. Uh, they didn't report on his, on his romantic affairs, but the media all knew about it. So it even affected the news media's coverage of King and the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. 
You know, the word that comes to my um, uh, to my mind right now is a kaleidoscope. As I think about Dr. King, there's so many intersections. Uh, there's so many ways to view his life. And, and you mentioned uh, several of them. But what perhaps most astounded me um, as I read the book is, is, not, is not just his relationship with President Johnson and President Kennedy, uh, but also you mentioned the KKK, then there's SNCC, then there are communist influences, uh, so to speak. Uh, and then there are those who he trusted intimately, um, uh, like Bayard Rustin. And then I think about his relationship with Ralph Abernathy and each of these individuals or organizations or groups um, have a different spin or take or narrative about the life of this phenomenal human being. And yet uh, he is flesh and blood. Um, and so what were some of your uh, unique perspectives as you reflect uh, personally on the life of Dr. King? You can certainly see how much he struggles, even as an early, even as a young man, he's struggling to break from his father and his father's expectations. His father was overbearing. His father um, was physically, um, I don't want to say abusive, but, you know, uh, punished the children with a belt. And, and King all his life struggled with how to separate himself from his father, but also at the same time trying to please his father. So, you know, he doesn't want to go into the ministry at first. And then when he does go into the ministry, he wants to, he sets out to really try to be a very different kind of preacher than his father. And at every step throughout his career, he's, he's, he's challenged by his father. It's so interesting that he goes back to Ebenezer and becomes the associate pastor there working under his father, even after he has won a Nobel Peace Prize and emerged as, you know, one of the most powerful men in America. Um, the struggle is constant. And, and interestingly, Daddy King, as everybody calls him, is constantly telling his son to quit. He's saying it's too dangerous. Don't put yourself out there. The very first time that his home is bombed in Montgomery, early in the, in the protests, early in the Montgomery bus boycott, Daddy King shows up on, on his son's doorstep and says, you're coming with me. You know, we're leaving town. This is over. You know, it's, you know we're not going to, you're not going to risk your life for this. And Martin and Coretta, to her credit as well, stand up to him and say, we're staying here. We have a responsibility. But King, even then, can't quite say no to his father. He still struggles with that. And, and I think it's very interesting to see how throughout his life, King has a hard time saying no to people. He has a hard time standing up to authority figures. He's afraid of, 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 of Roy Wilkins and, and um, he's afraid of A. Philip Randolph. He's, you know, he respects these men, but he, he, he is, is always reluctant to get into a conflict with any of them. And I think it goes back to his relationship with his father, this urge to avoid conflict. Um, so here you have a great protest leader who doesn't really like conflict. It's, it's fascinating to watch him operate. But um, that's just one example of the many ways, you know, he suffered anxiety. He was hospitalized numerous times for what he called exhaustion, but Coretta and others called depression. Uh, this was a real man who struggled with real feelings. You know, he, he was 26 years old when he emerged as the leader of the Mus Montgomery bus boycott. He was only, you know, he was 12 years younger than JFK. We think of JFK as being, you know, such a young president. Um, King was King was a very young man throughout his throughout all of these affairs, all this all of his career, really. Mm -hmm. um, um, I'm taking note of the fact that you uh, mentioned when he took the uh, job. Uh, I I believe it was in April of 1954. He wrote a letter to the church, um, uh, Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, and accepted uh, of the call to serve them as as their senior minister, and. Um, I can't remember the page that it's on, but I can, but I can see it in my mind. Uh, Daddy King was not happy. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. He thought it was a, a blue blood church. He thought it was too um, hoity toity and that they weren't, you know, the King kind of people that uh, he thought that they were a bunch of snobs and that um, his son was making a mistake going there. Mm -hmm. So um, even but, but let's look at this, um, and maybe some who are listening and, um, and who will listen will uh, take the time to understand the heritage. Uh, Dr. King just didn't pop up out of nowhere. His, uh, his grandfather was a minister um, at the same church that his father succeeded him, or rather his father-in-law, AD, AD, and then 
and then his dad, and then of course Dr. King. Um, um, but 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 and, and then he was surrounded by these other enormous uh, figures, uh, Benjamin E. Mays. Um, but the one that we don't hear a lot about, um, and I wish we could uh, know more about him, is Vernon Johns. Um, uh, tell us something about Vernon Johns and his eclectic, unique personality and how that may have paved the way for Dr. King's uh, ministry to take off in, in the manner in which it did. Well, he was the pastor of, of Dexter Avenue Church before King got there. And he drove the congregation crazy sometimes because he was so uh, unpredictable and so challenging. You know, um, he he would um, sometimes bring, you know, fruit and vegetables from his from his garden to church um, and, and hand it out after services or say they were for sale in the in the parking lot just to remind his his hoity toity congregants that that uh, they weren't so fancy as they thought they were. Um, and he challenged them. He you know, he. Um, he really pushed them to confront racism, and many of them were well established. They had jobs, and they didn't want to risk those jobs. and And Reverend Johns was always pushing them out of their comfort zone. So um, when when King came along, I think the congregation was looking for somebody who would be similarly um, courageous, but with a little bit more polish and um, a little more professionalism. So I think it was important that Johns um, established that this church stood for for um, more than just um, moral uplift when it came to their their personal lives, but that they had a responsibility to change society as well. Mm -hmm. What made him such a beloved figure uh, at Dexter succeeding Vernon Johns? Um, I noticed that you write about that and perhaps there was at some point in the future where some persons came together to issue commendations of some kind. I don't quite remember exactly um, how you describe it, but I do catch the point that many celebrated him and rejoiced over him, but they didn't have a whole lot to say about his wife, Coretta. In spite of that gap, I think, um, what made him so beloved, so unique, so special to the people? When he came to the church, there was a lot of skepticism because he was so young. And he was, you know, he's a short man, so he looked even younger than he was. Um, and it, it didn't take long, however, for people to realize that he was an incredibly gifted speaker and very well organized, very um, thoughtful and, and concerned and, you know, visited um, families, did all the things, you know, really ministering to his flock. Um, when he became famous, when he gave the speech at the beginning of the Montgomery bus boycott on December 5th, 1955 at Holt Street Baptist Church, where the entire Black community was gathered. That's really the moment that people fell in love with him, however. That's the moment when he becomes a true leader. And you see people all over Montgomery, you can read their words in, in um, their memoirs, in newspaper interviews, in, in um, interviews with sociologists at the time, where they say, this man is God sent. This man is special. You know, you can fire me from my job. You know, there's, a, there's an interview, a great interview with a housekeeper a woman named Dealey Cooksey, who tells this sociologist to tell uh, that that she confronted her employer, um, risked her job by saying, "Don't you dare talk about Dr. King! Don't you dare criticize him! He is he he is sent by God for us, and we believe that he is leading us." You know, um, and, and there's a there's a ferocious um, affection for this man. I think it comes from the fact that he's so. Uh, such a beautiful speaker, and he's he's tapping into things that almost everybody feels passionately about. He's tapping into the Bible. He's tapping into the Constitution. He's tapping into the the the, the most basic concept of all in the Bible and in our lives that is love. He's saying we must love our neighbors and and we must show these white people who have been mistreating us that we love them until we will love them and love them until they break down and recognize that we are not their enemies. And, and that is just something that people connect with in, in a way that, you know, I think still gives me goosebumps. Mm -hmm. I, I see consistency um, in his life uh, from the standpoint that he always seemed to um, uh, gravitate towards those who were less fortunate than he. He wanted to learn uh, the, uh, their stories, uh, feel their feelings, uh, even as a youth. And so would you tell us a little about how you 
uh, tackle that experience and connect that to his ministry in Montgomery um, and certainly the bus boy and certainly the bus boycott. It, it's worth noting that King was born in 1929 at the start of the Great Depression, and he grew up during the Great Depression. So he saw the suffering going on in the community, and the suffering, of course, was more acute for Black families um, in the South than it was for white families. They were not able to receive many of the same government benefits and work programs that were available to white families. But King was somewhat sheltered from, from the, from the um, troubles of the Great Depression. He was even sheltered from some of the worst examples of, of racism in the South because he was a, the son of a, of a, of a preacher. Um, he had a respectable family. He had a, um, a respected family, I should say. And he um, had a fine home. He had a house cleaner. He had pets. You know, he was, and I think he felt a lot of guilt about that, to be honest, uh, especially when he went to Morehouse and met kids who'd um, who'd been through a lot tougher uh, upbringings than him, who had experienced a lot of, um, harsher treatment than he had. I think all his life, really, he felt that he had that he was somewhat privileged and he had a responsibility to to act, um, to do something to help society, to to make up for the fact that that he had these advantages all his life, especially as a young man. Are you particularly intrigued by his decision to return to the South? having been so well uh, equipped to do so much more than just be a pastor in a small, um, a relatively small city uh, at the time, um, making only what amounts to today, as you note in the book, $43,000, uh, which is really okay if you're um, uh, in ministry, but it's not a lot of money. Right. Um, and so what, what, what drove him in your mind to make such a sacrificial decision uh, at such a young age? Well, over and over again, we see King not taking the easier path. Um, you know, he could have, he was, he was accepted to Edinburgh University. He could have moved to, to Scotland and studied there and gotten completely away from America's racism. Um, he, um, had job offers in the North after he graduated from seminary and from graduate school at Boston. Um, so he chooses to go down South. And then when he's in Montgomery, he actually gets offered a job um, at the chapel at um, Dillard University in New Orleans. And once again, you know, does not take that, that job because he feels he, a responsibility to minister to the people and to be active in the area where uh, Jim Crow racism is the worst. He feels like, he, and he says this on dates with girls when he's single, you know, I'm going to kill Jim Crow someday. And, and he takes that seriously. And he doesn't have to, right? He could do that for a couple of years and then go teach or, or take a ministry in a, in a northern church where there's a lot less stress and strain. But, it, you know, he believes in, in the words of the Bible. He believes that he has a mission, uh, that God is calling on him to do this work. And, and he's, he's looking to make the most impact. And, and that's a, that's a, it's a hugely courageous decision. Hmm. You tell the story that I think many find to be funny uh, when he gets in trouble um, in Connecticut one summer and, uh, and is called into the ministry, although he'd been contemplating it, and his friends tease him and say he wasn't uh, called so much as he was chased into the ministry um, out of fear um, of this event, uh, what happened in that episode, and 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 really, how did he actually, um, how did he grow from that experience, whatever it was? Uh, how did he grow from it, and 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 apply those lessons you think to his relationships in the future with law enforcement? Mm, great question. You know, as King was leaving high school and entering Morehouse, he spent a summer working on a tobacco farm in Simsbury, Connecticut. And he went returned for a second summer after his freshman year at, at Morehouse. They would um, pay the kids um, and pay their transportation back and forth. And the money would be applied directly to their tuition. And as, as you hinted at, one summer that King was up there, he and some of his friends were in a car. Um, and remember, this is King's first exposure to the North, really. It's the first time that he realizes he can go into any movie theater or any restaurant 
Um, but he also realizes there, there are limits to the North's um, so-called um, progressive nature that uh, there's still racism there and it's just maybe hidden a little better. And one day when he and some of his black friends are driving in a car in Connecticut, they're pulled over for no apparent reason, uh, perhaps just because they were black. Um, no citation was issued. We don't have a record of what they, of why, if any, if the, if the police gave any reason for pulling him over. But King was so worried that his father was going to find out about this, that he called his father and said he had finally made up his mind that he was indeed going to join the ministry. And, and that's also, as you hinted at, um, that's when his friends joked and said, you weren't called to the ministry by God, you were chased there by the police. <laughs> and, uh, and, and King, um, you know, King had a great sense of humor. I'm sure he, he laughed about that. But, um, you know, his experiences in the North were very important. His experiences, though limited with, um, you know, police harassment. Uh, well, they certainly were not limited when it came to the FBI harassment. And, and that's the ultimate form of law enforcement in this country. So he knew the power um, that, that white America, that the establishment had to uh, instill fear, to intimidate black people, to keep them from um, making demands by using um, police. And in fact, you know, we forget that in the March on Washington speech, the I Have a Dream speech, he, he singles out police brutality as one of the problems facing black people that America has refused to deal with. So, um, you know, King um, was very much aware of of how that uh, affected people in, uh, throughout the country. Mm -hmm. I'm going to read a passage um, from page one, page 538. Um, I don't know exactly where to begin, so maybe you can sort of um, you know chime in and let me know. Hey, there's some things that happened before uh, this right. section that you're reading. Um, um, but somewhere in the middle of page 538, to Andrew Young. King seemed more depressed than ever. He talked about death all the time. Martin was keeping a hell of a pace. He was speaking a lot. He was preaching every Sunday at church. He hadn't been on a vacation. He was staying up late at night arguing all the time. He didn't want to sleep. We used to say he not only had a war on poverty, he had a war on sleep cause he'd want to stay up and talk until three, four in the morning. And then he'd go to sleep and be back up at seven. He was just in an extremely hyper social period. And this is the point I wanted to get to. Ralph Abernathy, Ralph, Ralph Abernathy worried about King too, saying his friend seemed worried, nervous and very, very jittery. He recalled finding King on the balcony of a hotel at three o'clock one morning in 1968, staring at nothing. When Abernathy asked what he was doing, King pointed to a rock and began to sing the popular old hymn, Rock of Ages, which is often sung at funerals, given the last verse, while I draw this fleeting breath, when mine eyes shall close in death, when I soar to worlds unknown, see thee on thy judgment throne, rock of ages cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. I read that portion because I remember as a little boy, um, um, my older brother and I, my father came home and and we knew he liked this song. So we pulled out our church hymn books and we sang it for him. And, and, and it reminds me of how deeply religious he really, really was um, in spite of his depression and, and fear and resentment and anger and frustration um, and, and this gnawing sense that perhaps death was near uh, he never really abandoned the core values and the core essence of his faith in God, did he? No, he never did. And, and thank you for reading that so beautifully. It sounded wonderful in your voice. Um, but, I, you know, as you were reading it, I was struck by the idea that King really was in those last years deeply depressed and kept referring to his own death in sermons um, and in speeches um, you know, he gave that one of my favorite sermons, the drum major, um, 
instinct in, in which he talked about what he would like his, his own funeral to look like. And it, it's, it's harrowing, it's, it's disappointing, it's, it's heartbreaking to think that this man was so obsessed with his own demise uh, when he was still so young, when he still had so much to look forward to. But that goes to what uh, a great burden he, he, he had placed on him and how much he had suffered for his beliefs, for his faith. But as you say, he never lost hope. And he kept saying, I still have a dream. It might look like a nightmare right now, but we can't lose hope. We must be alert. We must be um, awake to change. We must be prepared for the challenges, but we can't give up. And that, as you said too, it it's, comes from his faith. His faith was, was unshakable. Hmm. Hmm. Who did he have more uh, respect for? His father or officials of the state like, um, like JFK? I think um, he was deeply conflicted with America's leaders. Um, he was a moral man who could never quite get his head around the way politicians thought. He was constantly, almost in a naive way, disappointed that JFK and LBJ weren't doing the morally right thing. Uh, why would they... He knew that they believed in equal rights. He knew that they believed in, in voting rights, but they were making trades. They were delaying these reforms because they were worried about losing votes in the South. And King was just, you know, it, it, it's kind of beautiful, but it's kind of, you know, naive too. Like he just couldn't understand why they wouldn't just do the right thing and, and forget about the politics of it. And and I think that led to a lot of frustration and and certainly, um, with LBJ, when King began to call out the Vietnam War, and, and that was, you know, LBJ's war, and LBJ took it personally. LBJ thought this guy, I thought this guy was my friend, he's, he's backstabbing me. You know, LBJ was, was, um, was having nightmares of his own about that war, and couldn't see any way out of it. And then King comes along and calls him, you know, a purveyor, the worst purveyor of violence in the world. And, and, um, that made for difficult relationships because in a way they just fundamentally didn't understand each other. King couldn't understand how a political mind could operate so callously to morality. And these politicians thought King was just naive that he didn't understand the way the world really worked. Mm -hmm. I know this is pure speculation, but, um, but I get to speculate today. Um, sometimes I've, 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 I've wondered if LBJ um, might have become so furious with uh, Dr. King uh, that he um, let the dogs loose, so to speak. Um, and there are all kinds of conspiracies about uh, who killed Dr. King and how it transpired. And I wonder, and maybe you have some thoughts about this, um, could LBJ have been the type of person who would have turned the dogs loose? and said, let happens, let what happened will happen. You know, I, I don't like to speculate, um, but I will say that LBJ knew what the FBI was doing. Uh, and the FBI knew that they were creating conditions that would make King deeply unpopular, that would send a message that he's not a patriot, that uh, he's a threat, in fact, to American democracy. And the FBI knows when they do that, that it's possible that you might give someone an idea to assassinate that figure. So um, I think they are all complicit in his death, I, but I will not speculate as to you know, whether, there was a, whether there was a plot uh, particularly to, to hire a gunman or to, to set a gunman in motion. That's, I just, uh, I don't see any point in going there. Okay, okay fair enough. And, and I can accept that. I'm, I'm, willing to, uh, I'm willing to rescind my speculative uh, notions about LBG. It's just a scurrilous thought that came to my mind. I wondered about it. Um, there's a book that's been written, I forget the author's name right now, but he teaches at Stanford University uh, on the role that uh, J. Edgar Hoover uh, and the FBI had in fostering and feeding what we now talk about as Christian nationalism. Uh, what would you say today that Dr. King would say about that ideology, uh, Christian nationalism, uh, which seeks to, uh, for those who are not familiar with the term, which seeks to imbue or endow uh, the, a Christian 
uh, narrative over all other narratives in the country as dominant and manufacture policies uh, and laws that, that, that are in agreement or harmony with a Christianized worldview. What do you think Dr. King would say uh, about that today? Let me say, first of all, that's a terrific book. Uh, it's by Dr. Lerone Martin of yes. Stanford. And um, and I would add that, you know, he, he very distinctly uses the word white Christian nationalism to suggest that there is a there's a combination there that is even more pernicious because it is invested in maintaining a certain kind of a power structure that keeps the control um, and the power under not just Christians, but white Christians in particular. And I think Dr. King was very explicit in his insistence that there should be a separation of church and state and that um, he was he was um, a believer in equal rights for all. And he uh, did not believe that you know Christians or anyone else should be controlling the government, that the government should represent all the people. So um, I think he would have a, he would have a hard time with that, certainly. And um, given that the uh, white Christian um, nationalists, as represented by J. Edgar Hoover, were, were out to destroy him and were out to destroy the civil rights movement, uh, he would have all the more reason. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the reasons you agreed to come and, and share with us is because you're very interested in helping young people understand the life of Dr. King. And as it has been said by our uh, president of our Young Dems of the North Carolina Democratic Party, uh, he intends to share uh, this conversation with him. And I'm, I'm very happy to hear that. Um, one of the observations that you make and others have made it as well, is that when he began his formal ministry, Dr. King was only roughly 24, 25 years old. And Ralph Abernathy was only two years older approximately. And yet they come together and they lead the Montgomery Improvement Association uh, as young men, um, they overcome their fears in ways that perhaps the prior generations had not learned to. And so what does that say um, to those who are younger, who are looking for a flag to carry, uh, a cause for which they might stand? Um, what do you think they can draw from the life of Dr. King, as well as his good friend, uh, Ralph, Ralph Abernathy? I would add um, that it's King, Abernathy, and countless thousands of people yes. who are throwing themselves into a movement without knowing what, where they're going or what they're going to accomplish or whether they're going to succeed. And it's, it's an incredible kind of um, bravery to embrace that chaos. You know, when you think about King's career, he's going from one place to another, from one movement to another. Um, just trying to see what might work. And so Montgomery works very well, but then he goes to Albany, Georgia, and it doesn't work very well at all. He goes to St. Augustine, Florida. It doesn't work very well at all. And he does not have a career path. He does not have, um, a, you know, plan B. He's just trying his hardest all the time and, and, and he's willing to fail. And he's willing to take risks. He's willing to, you know, when things aren't going well in Birmingham, he doubles down. He says, we're just going to have to get more of us arrested. We're going to have to, you know, we're just going to have to call, call up the, 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 uh, the reinforcements and, and they bring young people, students out to get arrested. A very controversial move that even Malcolm X thought was, was far too aggressive. So King and, and, and so many others are throwing themselves in without knowing what comes next. And what they're doing is following their, their core beliefs, feeling like we know we're doing the right thing. And, and it might not work, but we have to try. And when you have that feeling that you have to try, you have to get off the sidelines, I think um, that's that's everything because it's so easy right now to, you know, to hit the the, the, the tweet button and to, uh, or the, the X button, whatever it's called now, uh, to post something on Instagram or, um, and to feel like you've done your part. Um, but th those people were at that time, uh, those, those activists were risking their lives without knowing if it was going to work. And I think, you know, we have to remember that um, it's easy to look back on it now and go, yeah, they were great heroes, but they didn't know they were gonna be heroes. They thought they might be failures. Hmm. I'm gonna quote of a, um, a statement by Teddy Roosevelt. 
Um, I'm not exactly sure when he said it, but I believe that this quote can be attributed to him and ask you for uh, how do you think Dr. King dealt with uh, this idea? Comparison is the thief of joy. Hmm. That's interesting. Um, King really couldn't compare himself to anybody. I mean, I think he was always comparing himself to his father. Um, but as an activist, he was at a unique moment in history. There was there had never been anything quite like this before. He couldn't say, I'm going to follow in the footsteps of Teddy Roosevelt or anyone else. Um, because as I said earlier, he was a protest leader who was trying to lead a protest to join the society that they were protesting. There was no script for that. And I think one of the King's great assets is that he's a brilliant improviser. He's constantly trying new things. Um, people are saying, don't go to Chicago. You don't know what you're doing there. Um, people are saying, don't start a poor people's campaign in Washington, DC. You don't know what you're doing there. And he's willing to say, yeah, you're right. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just gonna see what happens. And, and, and he's, he's, he's trusting himself. He's trusting um, his, his supporters, his followers, and he's trusting God that, you know, if he, if he does the right thing, something good will come from it. I'm going to read a passage of scripture and get your reaction to it with respect to the life of Dr. King. St. John chapter 12, verses 24 through 26 say, in the New International Version, verily or very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed, but if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. It reminds me of what King said, and that the man who's not willing to die for something has nothing to live for. And I think King knew that there was a chance he was going to be killed. He was, you know, stabbed in the chest and his home was bombed. And he felt like he had to keep going because the message was what mattered and the message would live on without him. And I think even J. Edgar Hoover recognized that because when Hoover heard that King had been shot, the first words out of his mouth were, I hope the bastard doesn't die because they'll martyr him. And King, who knows what he would have done if he'd lived on. I would have chosen to ha let him have a long life to see what he could, um, how he could help us uh, forward. But his, his words continue to help us forward if we actually listen to them. You know, if we only listen to I Have a Dream, uh, we're, we're not taking full advantage of the lessons that King has laid out for us. His writings uh, um, should be taught in classrooms. His sermons should be listened to. Um, we, ha we have to go beyond I have a dream and really tap into what he's trying to tell us because as, you, as that verse that you read suggests, um, the seeds were planted and they continue to spread. At this point, we've got about maybe 10 minutes or so left in this uh, conversation. So what I'm going to do now is encourage those of you who want to, to uh, come on the screen. And um, if you have a question, we'll take up to three questions from uh, those of us who are uh, listening to this call tonight. Um, so those of you who want to come on the screen uh, and, uh, and ask a question, uh, feel free to do so. Uh, you can use the raise hand feature if you want to ask a question. And I'm going to, uh, now if you don't come on the screen, I'm going to call somebody out. So. Uh, I know you've got some questions out there. Um, um, I know Mr. I know Reverend Dr. Floyd Wicker probably has some good questions that he wants to ask. I know he is a keen um, a disciple with, with his work in here in North Carolina with the beloved community uh, and several others. I see uh, Sheila Huggins. She is a uh, 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 she's a member of the Democratic National uh, Committee. And she's running for elected office here in North Carolina, and there and there's several others. So, who of you wants to ask a question uh, to uh, to Jonathan tonight? Uh, good good evening, uh, Jonathan. 
and Dr. Paul McAllister. It's good to be on here tonight with you all. Um, in all fairness, Jonathan, I've listened to a few of your videos, um, so I feel like I've already gotten to know you and gotten to know your book. But um, it was something you just said that kind of uh, caught my attention. And it was something um, about what we can learn from King today. And it reminds me of a quote, I think the scholar's name, Stanley Horowitz, where he says, uh, the hermeneutical key to interpreting scripture are the lives of the saints. And I think what I try to teach uh, students where I work at, uh, at Shaw University, um, is trying to delve deeper into their own uh, discipleship. And I think when we, we can, we can learn a lot from Dr. King and um, I think we can learn a lot from his prophetic witness in this day and time, but I'm not sure, I guess I'm not even asking a question, but let me just say this. Um, I wonder, do you think nonviolence has a, has a, has a shot today? Because mm. King believed deeply in nonviolence and um, that doesn't seem to be a very popular popular ideology today. So I've got, I, I can ask you several questions. One question that came to mind was since you did do uh, a, a, a biography on Muhammad Ali, which is another one of my uh, fans, uh, favorite, favorite um, idols, I actually met him. Um, but anyway, I would want to know what would be a similarity between Dr. King and Muhammad Ali? That was that's just I throw that out there. But anyway, um, I'm happy to be on the call. Thank you, Dr. McAllister, and thank you, Jonathan, for uh, being with us tonight. Oh, thank you. I might let Dr. McAllister answer the question about um, whether there's room for whether there's a place for a nonviolent movement today. I think it's a harder sell uh, for a lot of people. But on the Ali um, question, I would say that Ali and Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, for that matter, all they disagreed. Uh, vociferously on on many things. Uh, Ali uh, and Malcolm X were opposed to integration, thought that the only way forward was for Black separatism, uh, but they agreed certainly when it came to the fight for Black dignity. And personally, they liked each other very much. Um, I think that Ali and, and King, um, despite their criticisms, really felt like they could learn from each other. The same goes for Malcolm X. I think um, King and Malcolm X had a lot more in common than we uh, give them, than we like to think, uh, that or that as the, or that the media has portrayed. And uh, Floyd, I'm going to say to you um, that I think the answer to your question is a definitive yes. That there is a place for nonviolence in the world today, and I'm glad you asked that question. I'm going to go ahead and say this. Um, I don't know how much King may have read. Uh, uh, René Girard, uh, who was a French philosopher uh, and literary cr a critic and historian. But when we think about violence uh, and the motivation of violence, I think everything that King aspired to be and everything that he modeled through nonviolence would have been consistent with the idea that selfless service and self-sacrifice and surrender and that scripture I just read from St. John regarding a kernel of wheat falling to the ground and dying and becoming more than just a single seed, but really producing uh, a kind of harvest um, is what we see. And so invariably, existentially um, and experientially, uh, I am very confident that the words, the life, the witness, the testimony of Dr. King is alive in all of us who still preach and teach and advocate for the philosophy of nonviolence. So I, ho I hope that answers your question. Now, uh, Jonathan, would you want to add to uh, uh, that in any way at all? Uh, I would just add amen. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I see my good friend, Bishop Van Guyton here. Uh, thank you for joining us, Bishop. Uh, we're taking a few questions. And so would you like to ask uh, Jonathan a question about his book, and the life of Dr. King. I know you have studied him over the years. 
uh, and, and, and when we met at Oxford, we talked about uh, uh, the life of Dr. King in, in many ways. So do you have any questions that you want to ask him tonight? I think you're muted, Bishop. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Uh, I have not read your book as of yet. And uh, I guess I'd like to know maybe what is your central theme that runs through your book? I, I, I would say that the central theme is that um, King has um, was a much more radical person, a uh, radical figure than we've given him credit for in recent years. Uh, I wanted to write a book that showed his humanity, uh, that, that humanized him in a way that a lot of other books haven't. And um, I also think a central theme is the fact that, um, you know, his humanity was weaponized by the FBI in an attempt to destroy him. Mm -hmm. A very brief uh, summary, I think that might that might be it. Uh, you know, in, in King's book, uh, Stride Toward Freedom, uh, he, he, um, proposed in there that um that we're, we're in a crisis and he says that the uh, the church and not the law is going to help solve the problem because it's a moral problem not a legal problem and then he goes on to say that one of the steps that he considers important is that um we've got to get to the root of ideational race hate does your book say anything about that? Yeah, I think um, it absolutely does. And, you know, as you, I think, are getting at, he's he's saying that you have to have the moral argument behind you if you're going to make uh, reform in, in, in legislative arenas, too. And that um, he, I think he hopes to expose the level of hate so that white people in particular in the North would see what black people were up against in the South. And then from there, he began to point out just how um, much racism there was in the North as well. Once he got people's attention in the South, you know, to his everlasting credit, he was not uh, going to be confined to that. And he came to places like Chicago, my hometown, and said, you know, you're, 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 you may be camouflaging it or attempting to camouflage it better, but you, you know, you're um, segregation, your racism is just as pernicious. So I think, you know, King was always um, calling on the morality first and then using that as a, as a tool, um, uh, a crowbar to pry legislative change and, and societal structural change. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you. I'm going to read one last passage and uh, get your reflections on this. And this is toward the end of the book. Uh, a passage uh, that he spoke that perhaps many of us have already heard, perhaps others have not. Um, but you write on page 540, uh, Jonathan. Every now and then, King said he thought about his own death and what people would say at his funeral and whether he would be judged uh, worthy to sit by Jesus' side. He didn't want a long funeral, he said, he didn't want his eulogist to talk about his Nobel Prize or his college degrees. I'd like someone to mention that today that Martin Luther King tried to give his life serving others. He said his voice loud, strong and quivering. The word tried, full of grit and gravel. The congregation was wrapped. His father was silent. I'd like for someone to say that day that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to love somebody. I want you to say that today that I tried to be right on the war question. I want you to be able to say that day that I did try to feed the hungry and so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. um, rapturous, yeah, it, rapturous. It, it's so powerful. Um, the key word to me there is try. He says over and over again, he tried. He didn't always succeed. He always tried. And I think he felt like whatever shortcomings he might have had, wherever he, he fell short, he had tried. He tried to love and to be loved. Sophie Teague has a question. Sophie, would you introduce yourself to, uh, to us again? This will, uh, this will be the final question. Um, uh, you, are a, uh, you are an Eva Clayton 
uh, a fellow? Yes, yes. Okay, tell us what that is so Jonathan understands what that is. And then so it's, it's a fellowship with the Democratic Party. Um, there are fellows in different departments. So I'm working in the Coalitions and Community Engagement Department. Um, my question is a little less about thematic or... Um, I, I guess my question is... How do you start your writing process? I know you talked about your your journalism and that you've written a lot of biographies in the past. And I was just wondering how you start that process. That's a great question. And I'm happy to, to end on that note because it's all about research. It's all about attempting to understand something you don't know about. And in a, in a way, that's an act of love too, I like to think. So I'm going to devote six years of my life to trying to understand Martin Luther King, and I'm going to devote many more years to talking about him and continuing to learn about him and learn from him. So I spent years researching and writing and interviewing people before I even think about typing the first word, because to, to attempt to tell someone's story, you have to attempt to understand them. And um, especially for me, as somebody who um, didn't know King, uh, a, a white man, a Jew, I had extra work to do. I had to really work very hard to attempt to understand him. And um, that, to me, um, was just a, a, an honor and a privilege. And I just felt a great responsibility to try to live up to that. I'm going to take a moment of personal privilege, as I've known to do at the end of programs. Um, yeah. I I'm going to first explain Eva Clayton Fellows, then I'm gonna ask you a question that I think would be the perfect question to end on. Um, Eva Clayton Fellows is a program for students in North Carolina that um, are underrepresented in politics. And it's always going to, it started out as to honor Eva Clayton, of course, but, and, and we have her join us from time to time at events, which is always lovely, um, but the, point of the program is to make sure that someone who normally would not have the opportunity to get that training in the political um, field before actually entering the workforce has that opportunity. And as a woman, um, Sophie has done a great job and we are so appreciative of having her on our team this year. Um, but my question for you, Jonathan, is was there anything that you learned about yourself in the process of writing this book? Mm. Very good. That's a great question. You know, I think I learned that um, it's easy to talk about what you believe in. It's, it's another thing to act on it. And um, as, as someone who's writing a book about King, I feel like uh, that's barely dipping my toe into the water of trying to, to live up to the words of the Bible, to live up to my beliefs, to live up to the teachings of King. We all just have to work day after day. Um, and we have to, you know, really be conscious and not fall asleep. And, and King, I think, was a great example of that kind of that level of commitment. And um, I think it inspired me just to try to, to be better. Thank you, Jonathan, for being with us and taking up your time. Um, I met you just a few weeks ago when you were speaking here in Charlotte and, uh, and getting my book signed, which I have in front of me. Um, all 600 plus pages of it. I'm, I, I am fully committed to reading it. And um, and um, and this is kind of like a Bible, if you will. Um, and it is the and it is now considered to be the definitive work on the life of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. So for those who don't know that, uh, this is why we were so eager uh, and gratified to have you with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure, and I look forward to continuing to be in touch. Okay. All right. And Shante, the floor is yours. Thank you. I just wanted to let everyone know we have um, the website where you can watch. Uh, if you came in late, you can watch this video again or catch other programs we, that we hold at ncdp.org forward slash CCE. And we uh, post the videos from the different sessions and the different programs. So hopefully you'll enjoy uh, catching up with all the programs you've done in the past and in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Phyllis. I see you there. It's good to see you. All right. Good night, everyone.